best days because people are seeking and looking and, 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 and wanting to find out what is it all about. This world that we're living in, it's a challenge. We can admit to that, right? It's a challenge. It has been. Well, there's a number of years ago, there's a story uh, that, that uh, described a, a posting at the university, Emory University. There was a bulletin board there in the administrative building uh, at that university that was used for posting various information as well as tuition rates. They'd put the tuition rates on there to let everybody, they didn't want to say it in person, they just let them know on paper on the bulletin board. And, uh, but uh, it was noticed that every department and every school had a significant tuition increase, which seemed you know, pretty much the norm these days, except for one. There was one that didn't because Candler School of Theology was so heavily endowed that their tuition stayed the same. Someone noticed that significant difference between the School of Theology and the rest of the department. So with red ink, they went up to that bulletin board and they began to write on that piece of paper that showed the tuition rates. And the message went like this. It said, Jesus talked a lot about the use of money and possessions. 16 of the 38 parables are concerned with how to handle money and possessions. Uh, in the Gospels, an amazing one out of 10 verses, one out of 10, 288 in all d deal directly with the subject of money. Don't get nervous. The Bible offers 500 verses on prayer and less than 500 verses on faith, but more than 2,000 verses on money and possessions. And then it said, since Jesus and the Bible talk so much about money and possessions, they must be an important issue in the kingdom of God. Oh, here we go. But why is that? I mean, I mean why is that? The, the passage for this morning, it addresses that in Matthew 25. Where you've, heard, you've heard it before, the talents, uh, the, the parable of the talents in, in Matthew 25, 14 through 30. It goes like this. It says, again, and once again, I'm in the NLT. Again, the kingdom of heaven can be illustrated by the story of a young man on a long trip or the story of a man on a long trip. Uh, he called together his servants and entrusted his money to them while he was gone. He gave five bags of silver to one, two bags of silver to another, and one bag of silver to the, re uh, the last, dividing it, it says, in proportion to their abilities. He then left on his trip. The servant who received the five bags of silver began to invest the money. It, it, notice that. He began to invest the money and earn five more. The servant with the two bags also went to work, it says, and earned two more. But the servant who received the one bag of silver, what did he do? He dug a hole in the ground and he hid the master's money. And after a long time, their master returned from his trip and called them to give an account of how they had used this money. The servant to whom he had entrusted the five bags of silver came forward and with five more bags. He, he, he brought five more. M master, you gave me five bags of silver to invest. I have earned five more, he said. The master was so full of praise. Well done, he said, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Uh, in verse 22, the servant who had received the two bags of silver came forward and said, Master, you gave me two bags of silver to invest, and I have earned two more. The master said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in handling this small amount, so now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. Then the servant with the one bag of silver came and said, Master, I knew you to be a harsh man. A little different tone here. I, I knew you to be a harsh man, harvesting crops you didn't plant and gathering crops you didn't cultivate. I was afraid, he said, that I would lose your money, so I hid it in the earth. Look, here is your money back. But the master replied, you wicked and lazy servant. If you knew I had harvested crops and did, uh, where I didn't plant and gathered crops I didn't cultivate, why didn't you deposit my money in the bank? At least I could have gotten some interest on it. And then he ordered, take the money from the servant and give it to the one who, uh, with the ten bags of silver, to those who use well what they are given. In verse 29, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have an abundance. But for those who do nothing, even with what little they have will be taken away. Now throw the useless servant into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. This, the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Father, we give you thanks for your word. It is so good, Lord. It speaks to us, Lord. May we not just hear a theme this morning, but might we hear personally from you, Lord, as to uh, how we are using the resources that you've given us, Lord. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. 
So just what is a talent? In, in, in your like NASB, perhaps even the King James, you'll, you'll hear the word talent. Uh, a single talent is actually a measurement of weight. It's not really an amount, it's a measurement of weight. But, but even as a measurement of weight, we can understand that it represented a, a really a large, a huge sum of money. It was equal to what is called a 6,000 denarii, uh, or, or if some have noted, that it could be as much as 20 uh, years worth of wages. Just one. 20 years worth of wages. Now, according to the U.S. Census, I think 2019, somewhere in there, the median income in America is somewhere in the range of 68,000-ish dollars. That would mean that in today's market, one talent would be equal to $1.374 million. That's a, that's a, that's a lot. <laughs> isn't that a lot? That's still a lot today, isn't it? I mean, even if it's taxed at 62%, that's a lot of money, right? Now, that means that the other two received $4.1 million and $6.8 million to invest for their master. Each, each according, it says, to their ability to what he had entrusted. He, he knows his people. He knows what, what, how he can trust. So we're not talking small amounts, if you can imagine that. This was then, and, and it still is today, a significant amount of money, which means that the master had a significant amount of trust in the abilities of these three individuals that he employed. You must, you know, you just don't give that kind of resource to somebody who has not been tried and tested and found to be responsible. So in our parable, two of them, they invest, they, they work it, they, they use what has been entrusted with them and they double, they double that money. But the one, that other one, he lives in fear. He lives in fear and he buries it, digs a hole and buries it in a hole. The first two are, are praised and they're rewarded, but the one talent guy who buried the money, he doesn't, he isn't just let go. I never liked doing that. I, I, had a, I, I used to run some businesses, and there was those short occasions where things aren't working out, and you, you have to let someone go. They didn't just sit down with this guy and say, hey, it's not working out. Uh, we're going to have to part ways. No, no, this, this wicked and, and lazy servant in this time, in this place, it's kind of harsh, isn't it? Doesn't it, does it feel harsh in the day that we live? Hey, he brought back the whole amount. He didn't lose any of it. it. It might seem like it's hard, but the word says wicked and lazy. He's chastised, and he's, he's thrown out into outer darkness. It's a, it's a place, it says, where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's, it's severe. It, it sounds like there's something important here to learn. It is a parable, but there's something to learn here about all that God has entrusted to us and what we do with that. So what's the deal? I mean, again, he didn't lose the money. He actually made money and quite a bit, and he didn't lose any from the one, unless, of course, you consider what simple interest might have earned. I, when I was first, when Lynn and I were first married, I, I, I don't know how I got it. I, I must have conned my way into it. They, they let me run a bank. They let me run a branch. I was only 21, and they gave me this little branch with one other employee, and they said, you're going to run this branch. And you, you'd be surprised to know if you do any kind of like put your money in an account and try and get a little interest, what we get today. In that day, I could do a three, I could do a three-year CD, certificate of deposit, and you could get 10.5%. Wouldn't you love to get that today? I haven't seen that in a long, long time out of banks. Simple interest. <laughs> he didn't even do that, this servant. And it's from this parable of the talents that we seem to be informed that each of us are entrusted with certain things. There, there are certain things that God, uh, when we're called by his name, that he has entrusted us with and that we will give an account for our stewardship of what has been given to us. It's, it's apparent that God has entrusted certain assets to all people and for how we use or how we don't use those resources which God has entrusted to them. We may see it in the idea of Romans 9 where Paul speaks of the things that he's entrusted to Israel. Paul says, 
I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying, he says, for my conscience assures me in the Holy Spirit. I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my, anguish in my heart, for I could wish that I myself were accursed, cut off from Christ for the sake of my people, my fellow countrymen, who are Israelites. To them belong the adoptions as sons, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the temple worship, and the promises. To them belongs the patriarchs, and from them, by human descent, came Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Blessed forever. Amen, he says. You, you see, the Lord's rebuke of the scribes and the Pharisees is often couched in stewardship terms. Stewardship terms. God, God entrusted Israel and especially its leaders with the truth and they did not use it properly you see there's an idea here of an, an, ele an element of work there's something that we're to put our, our hands, our energies to the original text is quite clear here, it's, it is the first servant and we assume the second as well who immediately you notice that, that as soon as it's given to him, immediately they set off to work with the master's money it's not the money that goes to work. We, we would see it in those terms today. We'd say, you know, is your money working for you? That's, that's usually said by people that want you to deposit it with them. Is your money working for you? That, that's not what, what they were doing here. It's not the money that goes to work, but the, the worker. And in today's context of our money, they would say it differently. But then it was about the worker but if you've ever owned a business, you know full well that the money alone is not doing the work. It's not the money that's working, but the person that is responsible for the use of that resource. And, and when the third servant's excuses are set aside, it becomes clear that this servant, the, the one talent servant, was a lazy servant. He didn't do any work other than digging a hole. <laughs> There's a little work there, but... That was it. Dig the hole, put it in. He, he didn't even give the money to an investor or a banker he, uh, to let them do the work with it. He simply buried it out of fear. So what, what does it teach us when we look at parables like this? You see, in some ways, the word is teaching us that it's really not about money. <sighs> is that a relief? <laughs> I mean, it's really not about money. It's not. I know you showed up today and said, let's go try that church. And it's like, oh, you're talking about money. It's not really about the money or necessarily about the time or the resource. It's more about what we do with what we have. It's what we do with what has been entrusted to us. The master said here, take what I give you. Take what I give you. I'm going to trust you with what I'm giving you. It's extremely valued. Do you know that your entire life, we only, I don't know how many years we get. We get varying degrees of years, right? And um, maybe we'll get, I hope we get like 85, 90, 100 be fun. Well, I don't know if 100 be fun. But it's going to be, as long as, you, Lynn, my wife, she's, as long as you're with me, you know, that'll just be fun. But, but we don't know exactly, but with what he does give us, what are we going to do with it, with what we have? It's extremely valuable. It's mine, God says, and I don't want to give it to you while I'm gone away. I want you to take it, work it, do something with it. I'm coming back, and I want to see uh, what you've done with it, when I, what I've given you. I want to see what you've done with it. When I was in the jewelry business, that was another business. I did a couple businesses, didn't I, uh, early on. I was in the jewelry business in a company called Sterling Incorporated. They made me the store manager at the Hudson, Hudson Goodman Jewelers at the Brea Mall in Orange County. And uh, they turned over the keys to the store to me along with millions of dollars worth of inventory. And they trained me. They bonded me. They even polygraphed me. You ever been polygraphed? <laughs> They'd stick this wire around me, and they'd ask me a shocking question to get, a, to get something out of me, and then, then they'd start asking me if I've ever taken anything home from the store. And uh, I remember one time I admitted, I said, well, you know, the pins that we write up tickets with, they're from the store, and I put it in my pocket. And I remember a week later, the owner of the company came in, uh, the local company, and uh, said, uh, make sure you put those pins back. <laughs> I thought, wow, <laughs> uh, okay. But they polygraphed. They, they did all that. They trained and bonded, polygraphed. And then they said, uh, hire good people. Go hire some good people. Train them. And open the store every day. Don't miss it. Get there on time. Open it. 
We, the company, we want to see a return on our investment. We expect that this store will bring a return on what we've put into it. So every day, we'd show up, and we ran the gate up on the store, and we opened the vault and set out the beautiful pieces of jewelry, and people could come into our store, and they'd ask us to take out the diamonds out of our cases and let them see them and touch them and hold them and try them on. And, and we, we, we'd... Uh, we had to work at keeping the store clean. We'd mop it, and we'd, we'd empty all the trashes, and, and we, we'd go to work with what had been given to us. A great wealth had been given. There was risk in bringing items out of the case. We, there were times where people would smash and grab or grab it and run. And there's, there's that danger. But we had to be willing to suffer some loss in order that we might have a gain, a return on the company's investment that they had put into us. See, number one, we, number one, if you're a note taker, we have to risk it to gain it. We, we have to risk it. There's always a risk that, that is taking place in a, it's taking place in our text this morning. We can't just bury our resources. The life that God has given us and, ex, and expected that we will be, uh, be, be pleased upon his return, that he will be pleased upon our return. Our text this morning seems to be teaching us that we have to risk it, we have to work at it, we have to even maybe lose it to gain it. You see, Jesus saves us, and that really doesn't always have a lot to do with money, really, but, but it has everything to do with our relationship with God through Christ. In Matthew 16, 25, Jesus said, those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake, he says, will find it. We we know that the only way that we can gain our life, gain uh, uh, our freedom from sin, freedom from guilt, and receive the daily strength that we need to live for God is by surrendering our lives to God through Christ. We have to lose it completely to gain it. He gets it all. I I'll never forget, and I've told the story before, when Lynn and I sat across the table at the cafeteria at the hospital, and the doctor came and he started giving us percentages about whether or not we'd have our youngest daughter and that was, it was scary. And it, we, we, our old, did I say youngest? It's our oldest daughter. And, and uh, he sat there and gave us percentages, and w which meant there's, there's this percentage that she'll survive, but there's this percentage that she may not. And I remember Lynn and I staring at each other. And, and then we began to talk about it. We, we remembered back when we took Rebecca to church and handed her to our pastor. And he held her up and said, What a beautiful gift from God not yours we gave her back he held her up and we said God you gave her to us we give her back use this little life in any way that you see fit she survived and continues to do so doing very well but but there's that moment there's that moment when we have to take our entire being our entire life and say Lord you gave it to me well, what you've given you can take away Blessed be the name of the Lord. We have to lose it sometimes to gain it. Our baptism and our faith enable and empower us to do the things Jesus wants and calls us to do. It even enables us to use our financial and our physical resources, our, our money and our possessions to work with and invest with what God has blessed us with. There was a man who had a late conversion in life and he asked to be baptized and since the Methodists they, they accept all forms of baptism the pastor arranged to use the baptistry at the local Baptist church and after coming up out of the water the man uh, his eyes got real big and he said good grief preacher I forgot to take my wallet out of my pocket it's dripping wet praise the Lord exclaimed the preacher we could stand a few more baptized wallets around here I'm thankful today, though, to say that there are obvious sanctified wallets and resources here at Tinas for your faithfulness to God and giving continues to be, floors me every week, steady. Even during unnerving times, it, you're just faithful. But you see, money alone is not the only resource that are, that's in our hands. It's not just money. We may ask, how about 
our time? What of our possessions or the things in our lives that are not yet fully committed to Jesus? You, you see, we live in a fairly compartmentalized day. Uh, there are those that commit themselves to Christ, but they hold back some things. It can be their money or their possessions. It can be their time. It can be their thought life or some particular indulgence. And our Lord says, I don't want just part of you. I don't just want pieces of you, compartmentalized spots about you. I, I, I want all of you, all of you, the things in life that you find security in and over and above me. I want whatever that is. Actually, he wants to be our security. That's what God wants to be, our security. He wants to be our all in all. There are those that enter the Christian life holding back, holding on, clutching various things in life that bring a sense of security. In essence, what they're, they might be saying with their actions are, Lord, here I am, take all of me, except, except, you fill in the blank, whatever the Lord brings to mind. And we can... We can fill in that blank. I can fill my blank in. This withholding approach to Christian commitment, it, it isn't new. <laughs> it goes all the way back to the garden or, or like the story in Acts. There was a man named Ananias uh, together with his wife Sapphira. And they sold a piece of property, if you remember. Now, this was a time when many of the believers were selling their property and giving the proceeds to the work of the Lord. And Ananias didn't want to be left out of that spiritual momentum, so, so they sold it. It says, with his wife's full knowledge, he kept back. He kept back. He held something back, part of the money for himself, but brought the rest and put it at the apostles' feet. That, this kind of faith has been replicated many times over in the years. People talking and acting like they're totally committed, but actually withholding what they want for themselves. It's not a good idea as followers of Jesus. It's not a good idea. It's not God's plan for us. God's word, it continues there about this. It says, then Peter said, Ananias, how is it that Satan has so filled your heart that you have lied to the Holy Spirit and have kept for yourself some of the money you received from the land? You have not lied to men, he said, but to God, when he heard this, remember what happened to him? He fell down and died. It's a little harsh. That's how serious it is. Great fear, it says, seized all who heard what had happened. And later, Ananias' wife, Sapphira, she met with the same fate. And every believer was sobered by how seriously God takes it when we act committed but withhold things from Him. Every believer should still be sobered by it. The question that arises is, what is it? in our lives that we promise to God and that we commit to God and then we hold back from God. No, we don't die on the spot today like Ananias and Sapphira. But I believe that small pieces of our spiritual lives deteriorate every time we withhold anything that we've committed to God. Our answer is full surrender. Full surrender to God. Our entire lives, our fortunes, our families, all of it we are to risk it and work it, even lose it to gain it. Full surrender to God is what is expected. Holding nothing back, nothing. And don't forget, His grace is sufficient. As each of us that have been baptized into the Christian faith, we're submerged, we're buried with Him in baptism and raised in that newness of life. Is there anything that we can think of that the Holy Spirit reveals to us today that upon baptism kind of floated back to the top anything that was only partially baptized that day anything that had not been fully committed to Christ we, we can surrender those things today they only serve to get in the way to be, become stumbling blocks in our own lives for our continued commitment to Christ we must number one risk it, work it, even lose it to gain it and we must number two use it, don't lose it use it, don't lose it you see we have to oh that's not good right there how about that we have to did I scare you we have to use it don't lose it you, you see not only do we surrender our lives to Christ in order to 
receive the abundant life and, and eternal life. And yes, we have, to, we have to lose our lives in order to gain our lives, but we also have to use it not to lose it. Luke 17, 33, it tells us if we cling to it, our lives, we will lose our lives. But if we let our lives go, whoever gives their life away, they will preserve it. You see, if we try to hang on to our lives, we'll lose them. But if we will invest and work with what God has given us, our lives will be saved. And that's what happened in this parable. The first two, the five, uh, the five and the two talent servants, they invested what was given to them, the, that resource, that huge resource, and it was entrusted to them, and they were rewarded. But the one talent man had it all taken away. It's been said like this, Jesus saves, but we're called to invest. He, he saves, but we're called to invest. There's a story of an American businessman. His name was Wilson. No, not the, not the ball on the island, but... <laughs> He was tired of the Great Depression, uh, the rising taxes, the increase in crime. Does that sound familiar at all? He was just tired of it. With less responsibility and an easier way of living, in 1940, he sold his home and his business and moved to an island in the South Pacific to get away from it all. Beautiful weather, surrounded by exotic beaches. It was a paradise for him. Sounds like the perfect setting, doesn't it? You know what the name of the island was? Iwo Jima. You remember, right, in your history? You see, the grass is not always greener on the other side. It's usually greener where you water it, where you work at it, where you invest in it. And we can see that in this parable, Jesus, he's illustrating what watchfulness and readiness, what that is by what the servant or the slaves, uh, what they did with what was entrusted to them. In this case, it was money. But the question is, how should our opportunities be used that, that we have in life? How should we as followers of Jesus use the blessed opportunities that have, he has given to each of us? We are blessed just just look around at our, the lives that we lead even here. Our homes, our businesses, our, our transportation, our food and health. We have enormous value in our lives. And in light of his return, and, and you know he is coming back. That's still the truth. He is re going to return. He's coming back. And we know that. He's coming, and this parable is revealing to us that there's an expectation of the master, that there's something for us to do in his kingdom now moment. In our parable, the first two servants, they went right to work, and they doubled that resource. But the last servant, well, he, he buried it. He stuffed it down in the earth. This was not an uncommon practice of that day, though. There's nothing wrong with safeguarding the things of great value that that are ours to take care of. But you see, the, the master had a different expectation. It was his desire that his servants risk it, work at it, and perhaps even lose it to gain it. The third servant, he even played the, uh, the blame card. The, the, the blame card. He, he told his master, I knew you were a harsh man. You were harsh. It, it's, it's, it's you. It's not me. It's you. You're the one. If you were nicer, if you were kinder, it could have been different. The excuse that he is giving comes from fear. He feared the master. Fear of ha having done nothing with what was expected from him. And then he accuses the master, in essence, of exacting uh, interest from somewhere that he has not invested. The French have a saying for this pathetic accusation. And I don't speak French, but I'll, I'll try and give it to you the way it says it. It goes like this. Qui es excuses, se accuse. Stop it, Lynn. <laughs> She's thinking, you shouldn't even have tried that. <laughs> it was close. It was close. Qui se excuses, se accuse. Eh. Eh. Uh, here's what it means. He who excuses himself accuses himself. He who excuses himself, accuses himself. 
there, there is really irony here. It's quite hard to miss. It is that the, the master is far from what the lazy servant accuses him of. It turns out that the, the master is actually a very generous, generous man. He gives rewards to others. In, in verse 29, Jesus hits on this. He says, to those who use well what they are given, even more will be given and they will have abundance. They'll have an abundance. And to the contrary, continuing in verse 29, it says, but for those who do nothing, who dig a hole, bury it, who don't put their hand to any of it, even the little that they have, it says, will be taken away. Booker T. Washington started his life back as, as a black American slave, and at the age of 16, he walked almost 500 miles from his home to, uh, to the Hampton Institute uh, in Virginia. And when he got there, he was told that all the classes were already filled, but he didn't stop him. He didn't stop there. He went ahead and he took a job at the school doing small jobs, menial tasks, simple and basic, sweeping floors and making beds, anything that, that they wanted him to do, just so he could be around the environment of learning and he did those jobs so well that the faculty found room for him as a student. And he worked his way up at the school. He became a famous teacher, the first black faculty member at the Hampton Institute. And he became a writer and an author of the book Up From Slavery. He, he was a popular public speaker. And he eventually founded Tuskegee, uh, Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, where he brought George Washington Carver to teach. And he did all his research there, which changed and improved farming techniques. You see, Booker T. Washington, he used what was given to him. He invested it. Even when it was up against him, he invested it. He worked it. He put his hand to it, and many others have gained from it. Uh, basketball coach John Wooden may have said it best. He, he said it like this, don't let what you can't do interfere with what you can do. And the same holds true in our giving and in the use of our gifts and graces in the life of the church and in service to our Lord Jesus Christ. We, we can't let what we can't do get in the way of what we can do or what God can do through us. You may have noticed, if you've been here for very long, I don't overly speak about money. I've always felt that God is so good and faithful at speaking to each of us as to how we give. He needs neither our money nor our time, but, but He does know what it will mean for us personally to have our complete and total trust in Him. And that is why it's much better for us to give all that we are to Him and let Him lead us in our time and our talents. Today, maybe, maybe finances are, are in such shape that it seems impossible even to think about tithing. Or, or maybe some can't even give because they, they're out of work or there's just nothing left to give. And you know, I'm, I'm just going to say it. It makes, uh, I don't know, I think it makes some people nervous. I'm just going to say it. It's okay. Really? Well, yeah. I mean, it, it's okay. I, I know that God knows our hearts. God knows what you want to be able to do. So don't let the fact that you can't give what you want to give keep you from doing whatever you can. Continue to invest yourself you see, you can't support the church and invest God's work with your presence. You, you can do that. You can, you, you can invest with your presence, with your prayers, and, and with your service until you are able to support it with a tithe. And if tithing is an issue, then challenge. I've challenged myself over the years as, as a spiritual pursuit to grow at a rate even at 1% until we reach the goal that God is calling us to don't forever be a one-talent servant. Invest yourself in God's church. This isn't just about money security. It's also about our time, but both can be a real challenge in the day that we're living, can it? Does it seem like we have more time? Uh, I believe, you know, computers were supposed to really take care of a lot of things for us, and we're going to have so much time. It just doesn't seem to be working out that way. It can be a challenge that we live in but God calls us not to bury it but to invest work at it multiply it until his return don't let what you can't do interfere with what you can do use it don't lose it 
you may remember, uh, I know in the next number of services there's going to be a less and less that remember this, but there was a guy back when I was a little kid, and it was called the Jack Benny Show. I don't know if you remember the Jack Benny Show. It, it was in black and white when, when we had antennas on the TV. And uh, he always did the same routine over and over again. A robber comes in and, and points a gun at him and says, your money or your life? And there's no answer. And, and then the question is shouted out again, your money or your life? And Jack Benny, he still doesn't say anything. And the robber says a third time, your money or your life? And Jack Benny finally answers, I'm thinking, I'm thinking. Money or my life? I'm thinking. That's really what stewardship of our time and talent is all about. It's definitely what stewardship campaigns are all about to get us thinking about our relationship with God through Christ. It's not really about your money or your life. The truth is... Our, if our lives have been given to Christ, He already has our everything. And if He has all of you, then all of you, including your time and your talent, is being invested in Him. You see, the church isn't an organization that you give dues to or pay something to. The church is the body of Christ made up of disciples who have surrendered their lives to Him the Christian faith is a cause we invest our lives in because we've been given new life. We have to lose it to gain it. We have to use it or lose it. It's this kind of message is a struggle today. If it is, then consider surrendering, surrendering your entire self, all that you are, everything to Him. Our God is ready for us to put our entire security in Him today. In verse 23, we we find a wonderful reward. The master commands the two servants for, he commends the two servants for what they have done in doubling the, in the investments. The master tells them, well, well done, my good and faithful servant. And they both are given more responsibilities. And then he tells them this. He says, let's celebrate together. And oh, what a celebration awaits those who use what God has given them, investing, working, watching, and blessing others. And we here at Tinez have continuing opportunities to use our energy for others. Our Serve Saturdays, we got some uh, sign-up things in the back. You can put your name and your email down, and uh, when we have opportunities to go serve other people, Serve Saturdays are perfect for that, to using our physical energy to help uh, uh, lift the burdens off of others. You can sign up there. You can also, we have people throwing envelopes in here. We're going to fill these with everything you need to, to cook a turkey dinner, everything right down to the butter and milk, everything, and we'll pass those out next Saturday. We're hoping for about 25 of those that we can take out and give to others. That, that's just one way, our giving of our energies, or maybe the it takes $50 per turkey basket. It's what we can do to serve the Master, our Lord, working in His kingdom now, loving and serving others, not bearing it, but using it the gifts that God has given us to love and serve others. Stand with me, will you? Pray this prayer with me. Lord, did anything float back to the top when I was baptized? Lord, I surrender to you today. Take all of me, my time, my gifts, my talents. I give them all to you. Use them as you see fit. Reveal to me how you'd like me to use them. I thank you and praise you for it. I commit myself fully and totally to you this day. In Jesus' name, amen.